question is, not only to the panel, but to others in the audience, is what, uh, let's not talk about tipping points, but what political conditions could make this kind of, of multinational collaboration, this kind of research work, which requires uh, uh, institutional, local uh, 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 negotiation of permission, what could make it better and easier? Okay, who of the, the panel would like to answer first? Uh, otherwise, we'll leave it up to somebody in the audience who may answer. Anyone like Beth or June or Suzanne has an answer? Um, what kind of political I think that's setting? A, that's a really great question and, and something that we all struggle with because sometimes the, the local government actors are, are not very open. You know, to the particular kind of research or alliances of organizations and researchers that may be operating in a particular area. I mean, I think that from from our perspective is that I can't go in, the University of Florida can't go in uh, and expect to establish those kinds of relationships that we really do rely on our, our partners on the ground to be able to sort of open the doors and to build the the um, agreements and formal agreements that you know can outline specifically you know what we're hoping to accomplish together and so forth on the other hand we have also found that an organization like the University of Florida and somebody from the outside can sometimes be a neutral partner and can bring together you know organizations that may be in conflict with each other that may not come to the table together if one or the other, or maybe the government, was, was organizing you know, a particular forum or discussion, whereas they might be more willing to come to the table and talk about their interest um, with a sort of a neutral partner. I, I don't, I'm not sure that's really addressed your questions, but just some, maybe some I thoughts. I think has uh, yeah, an observation. Yes, please. I think you, you can just speak on that. Okay. Yes. So um, I have an experience in working with my Brazilian colleague, and you know what helped us most <coughs> was funding from the you know Brazilian uh, side. So uh, there was this I, ma I mentioned during my talk that there was this you know Green Ocean Amazon uh, a call from the Department of Energy of the U.S. And for, from that call, they asked us to team up with a with Brazilian colleague. And, um, and DOE you know, supported us and the uh, Sao Paulo uh, Research Foundation support my Brazilian colleague. And that was the, you know, the most useful thing for us to you know, have all this you know, research activity happen. So the Research funding, I mean, because I mean, everyone is busy. It's just, you know, without funding, it's very difficult to like, establish collaboration. And my colleague <coughs> told me that, you know, the funding is a bit drying up in Brazil, and that's the case for the US as well. So particularly for the, you know, um, for the tropical uh, research, I mean, I was asked that you know, a lot of research related to uh, that's related to tropics. Uh, we are encouraged to study uh, Puerto Rico instead of Brazil. So things like that, you know, that's the difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can go on to the next question, please. It's a little bit different. Uh, I'd like to just read it. Maybe to congratulate all the speakers. How is it that the parks transition that comes, to, comes together, the demographic transition towards, uh, can contribute for the emergence of infectious disease or chronic disease? That's a very interesting question. So you mean the, how the, the changes in forest will influence forest the disease? Forest influence demographic transition, and Human all together disease. can Human influence in chronic infectious disease, emerge of infectious disease. So that's not in an area that I'm very familiar with, but uh, we had a stu student at Brown who studied the link between disease and, and, uh, and uh, deforestation. And what they were finding is that 
the, the regions where uh, disease outbreaks, particularly that, you know, coming from animals, basically, is where deforestation occurs. So not in an urban area or not in the middle of the forest, but deforested area. So the study region was actually not in Brazil, but India. So with more uh, deforestation, there's more interaction, and you know, that's where um, the disease outbreaks, you know, the number is highest. Mm -hmm. We had the long-term project between the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and the School of Public Health. Department of Public Health of uh, School of Medicine um, back in the 90s, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Canadian Institute for International Development. And uh, we were focusing on arbo viruses, so arthropod borne diseases, viruses transmitted by arthropods. And uh, we were focusing on yellow fever, malaria, of course, and leptospirosis. leptospirosis. And um, uh, we studied how that happens. Uh, the, those diseases are in the forest. And there are animals, birds and small mammals, who uh, host uh, the insects that then may host the viruses. And the, the cycle of the disease is there. But then when humans come into the forest to cut the forest, to collect uh, rubber, or to harvest uh, Brazil nuts, uh, the cycle must be broken, may be broken. And then uh, some of those insects may bite a human. And from there on, the human brings it back to his, uh, his or her um, human habitation. So then it becomes a, a peri-urban type of disease. It's no longer a forest disease, it's a peri-urban disease. So then how to break that, because that's what you don't want. Uh, some of those diseases are not fatal, but they produce lots of economic loss and all kinds of psychological issues on people. Um, of course, some of them are fatal, like different types of malaria can be, depending on what type of population, two children or, and, and all that. Uh, but uh, um, definitely changes in land use are very, very influential. And we came up with recommendations in terms of changes of, of land use that shouldn't be made on how to, how to go through the forest and cut and not to be exposed, uh, all kinds of uh, um, and, and there are still some people at uh, the School of Public Health that could answer your questions with more detail because I was from the point of view of the land use changes on the forestry and then the other people were the ones who did all the, chem all the chemical and medical studies. Okay. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question unless uh, um, Asia may want to say something about time. Uh, our time is supposed to run until 4.30 and we're now 4.33. So can we get one more question? Asia tells me we have time for one more question. Great, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, you all, very good presentations. And my question relates to carbon credits. You must be familiar, I don't know, but it's, uh, it's been uh, sold in Brazil, many, uh, there's many European companies. And it came to my attention, one specific case, I have a, my brother is a human rights lawyer in Brazil defending a case of an indigenous group against an European company that so, uh, bought carbon credits for several decades. And now they're forbidden even to practice their own, like they can't fish, they can't hunt, they can, they can build their own uh, style of houses, housing because they're not allowed to deforest it. And it's considered a traditional lifestyle is considered deforestation. So I just want to ask if you're familiar with it, if there is any uh, maybe a thing that you know that uh, can provide a dialogue uh, between the, the, because what I think it's a uh, lack of the dialogue is, is essential there in, in the several uh, fields that are involved in this area. Since that Suzanne has an answer for well, it. Yes. Well, I actually I don't really have an answer, but which group was that? Do you Suruwe or Pondo? Suruwe. Okay. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's, I, I don't have an answer. I think it's a really tricky topic, and there have been a lot of people writing about the carbon credits with indigenous groups. Um, I wish I were more on top of that literature. I don't know, but it's not obviously a panacea. 
Yeah, yeah definitely, because uh, the indigenous peoples, there have been lots of studies done in Panama, where the the Cuna Yala, the Cuna people, meaning the people from, that's their name, Cuna meaning people, Cuna Yala. And um, they claim when uh, all these ideas about the red uh, project started, and Panama was chosen because of the general good conditions of the country, good communications, uh, good maps, and etc. Uh, uh, Panama was chosen almost as a, as a model country to implement red projects, reducing emissions for the, from deforestation and degradation. And then the Cunayala were asked to come into the dialogue. Good <laughs> that they did that. And I was there at the time, and the Smithsonian Institution was in charge of uh, much of that conversation. Uh, and they claim that the carbon is theirs because they have been in their land for a long time. And as you may know, uh, half of the carbon stock in the world is in the, in the soil, not in the forest. We tend to think about the trees and because they are there. They are more easy to see. But the soils are more difficult to study. Uh, but uh, in reality, if you look at what the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, etc., says, half of the carbon worldwide is, is in the soil. And they claim, the Cunayala claim that the soil is theirs. But of course, uh, it depends on the countries um, of the world, uh, what lies under your soil is yours or not. Like in this country, if you find oil, it's yours, isn't it? In other countries, you find yours, if you find oil, it belongs to the country, like Ecuador, and things like that. So, uh, but the Cunayala claimed the soil was theirs, and that was their carbon, so they had to be compensated for that. And then, uh, I won't tell you the end of the story, because I didn't continue on those. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that kind of uh, discussion a little bit died, kind of like out of exhaustion. There were no simple answers, as Suzanne said. I'm just telling you that uh, there is a very strong case, I think, from the point of view of the indigenous people. They have been on their land for millennia, and they own the soil. There is no discussion. Why would the government of Panama or another country say that the soil resources are theirs? <laughs> I do not know. There is an ethical, I think, uh, discussion there. But there is a very strong argument for, in favor of the local people, that that's their carbon. So in terms of assigning carbon credits, that becomes very fascinating. So uh, with that said, uh, I think we need to close our panel and uh, we thank you all of you for your attention and I think we're going to have something outside or we can continue. No, we can continue. Uh, Asia says no. Um, and Asia has the lead here. So, uh, but of course there may be inform informal talking if people want to stay around with the panelists or among yourselves and we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, well, uh, please uh, you do the announcements. <laughs> yeah, there's another session in just a few minutes. Okay, in just a few minutes you'll be back here for the next panel.